Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we believe mental illness can be temporary and transformative. Stay tuned for innovative, effective tools from experts in the field of mental health. Hosted by Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. This podcast aims to change the narrative around mental illness. Move from a place of fear to a place of hope and solutions. Here on On Your Mind. Rebecca Cully Healy, ND, completed her studies at the Naturopathic Institute of Therapies and Education and was board certified by the American Naturopathic Medical Certification Board in 2017. So Rebecca, thank you for being here. Welcome. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me on. Well, it's it's you were highly recommended to the uh, On Your Mind podcast by someone who's benefited from your services. And can you tell us a little bit about how you got into what you're doing and what, why you have such a passion for your work? So um, I believe that I have always been really connected to plants. I've always loved plants and flowers. Um, and I thought what I was going to do originally was genetics, actually. That's what I studied when I was in college. Um, for the first time. Um, then I stayed home with my children for several years. And through the course of that, um, I started to learn from other mothers um, really how helpful some of these natural herbs were. Um, you know, chamomile tea or a little bit of peppermint tea for an upset tummy. And, um, and that really sort of sparked my interest. And so when my children were a little bit older and I felt ready to sort of continue my career, um, I found a community herbalist and she was speaking of one of the groups I was a part of and um, it really triggered my interest. And so I asked her, um, you know, about her training and that kind of thing. And she pointed me in the direction of a place called the Naturopathic Institute of Therapies and Education in Michigan. And, um, before I knew it, I was enrolled there. That was in 2012 that I started my studies there. And it took about five years to complete the studies. Um, and at, at the end of that, um, I was able to sit for national board certification to be a naturopathic doctor. So um, along the way, um, I was really able to incorporate herbs at a very deep level into my studies. I took additional training um, through um, through Jim McDonald, who is um, a, an herbalist here in Michigan. And that really opened my eyes to um, the variety of uh, plants that just grow around us um, in our natural environment and what a strong impact they can have um, on the body. Well, so do you, tell us a little bit about how you offer your services and how people find you. Sure. Um, so I have an office um, in Fenton, Michigan. Um, I also am attached to a storefront um, that I opened just two years ago. Um, and uh, people can find me on my website, which is hawthorneandviolet.com. So it's hawthorne, like the tree, and A-N-D, violet, like the flower, uh, because those are both very potent uh, herbs that are favorites of mine, dot com. Um, and so people can, you know, read up on some of the services that I offer. Um, but one of the things that I discovered was that, um, you know, I would make all of these recommendations for people. And sometimes it was hard for them to source it locally. And sometimes ordering things online got a little bit questionable. So I started to stock bulk herbs and tinctures and that kind of thing that I could recommend directly to my people. Um, and it's been really wonderful because now, you know, the community can just stop in and, and, you know, we can have a quick chat and they can, you know, kind of pick out what, what teas they would like to, to try for themselves or tinctures or essential oils or CBD oil or that kind of thing. Um, one of the services that I offer um, that's sort of a relatively new one that I started offering that really incorporates some of my past studies, uh, which is uh, genetics, um, is really helping to match a person to uh, like on a genetic level, we use some of some genetic information if they've had some genetic testing done um, with some other factors and uh, really sort of find a unique nutritional program for them. Well, I know that one of the things that I encounter a lot is when people come in to see me and, and other doctors that they, they come in with a symptom or a series of symptoms they want to get rid of or they want something to change specifically. 
And my knowledge about integrative and uh, naturopathic uh, studies is that you tend to take a more holistic approach and you look at the system. So what's the, um, you know, what's the most common pattern of things people come in to see you for and how do you, what does it look like when people receive a consult from you? Yeah. So often when uh, people will come in, um, you know, they'll, they'll have some papers that they filled out beforehand that, you know, it sort of give me some, some idea of some of their history, but we spend a long time um, really talking and connecting because it's different for everybody. You know, somebody might have a diagnosis of anxiety, for example, um, and anxiety for one person may look a whole lot different than anxiety for another person. Um, and so we spend a lot of time really talking and connecting um, to figure out what that experience is like for that particular individual. Um, usually our appointments are, you know, up to two hours where, you know, we're getting a really full background um, history. Um, after they finish, I may give them a few suggestions at the, um, at the appointment, but then I will take some time to really reflect on what we talked about, um, consult some of my resources, and then I pull together a program for them um, in a written format. So, you know, they, they end up getting emailed in like a five page, um, uh, a plan that they can follow. And, um, and that addresses like a range of things. So, you know, usually there's a nutritional component. Um, there is almost always an herbal component. Um, there's, you know, some supplements sometimes if, um, if maybe like the food is gonna be a little bit um, more difficult for them to get in what they need to for, for a short period of time. Um, and then they take that information and I give them, you know, a couple of days to digest it and write down their questions. And then we have a, you know, follow up, maybe 15 minute phone conversation if they, after they've had a chance to absorb some of that information. And, um, you know, and then, then we go from there and then we meet up again, you know, depending on the person, depending on what the needs are, somewhere between 30 to 90 days later to see how things are going to um, sort of tweak the program a little bit and, um, and then go from there. So, you know, you mentioned anxiety, and, and here at uh, the On Your Mind podcast, sponsored by Journey's Dream, one of the things that we're trying to do is help rewrite the narrative on mental health to one in which optimal health and well-being is possible and expected. And so we have a focus here on the mental health, and the traditional medical approach to mental health is medication and if we're lucky, on top of the medication, lots of therapy. I've heard some things about how people say, oh, it's fine for me to take this because this is all natural. And they assume that just because it's natural, it's mild and it's not going to conflict with any other medications they're on. So can you speak to that? Because uh, uh, my knowledge is that some things are quite powerful, even though they're a naturally occurring substance and may have conflicts with existing medications. How do you address that? Sure, so um, we, we reference, first of all, we get a list of medications that the person is on and we have a reference guide that we can, you know, we can double check. But one in particular that we hear a lot about interacting with medications is St. John's work. So St. John's work got a lot of, um, uh, recommendations back probably in the, in the early 90s I think is when it really became big so a lot of people started to hear about St. John's work for depression um, and it can be helpful in some cases of depression but it's sort of not the end-all be-all um, and it has a really powerful effect on the liver um, it uses the same liver pathways as many of our medications and oftentimes what it does is it actually clears the liver pathway too quickly so if you have a medication that you're taking that is um, you know, required to sustain life or to sustain mental balance, um, and you're clearing it out of that liver pathway far too quickly, um, that, that could be dangerous. And so St. John's Wort, for sure, is one that does not mesh well with, uh, with medications. And so it's a good idea uh, when we are choosing these different herbs to you know, fully understand like, what medications a person is, is taking and make sure there's not any conflicts as far as um, liver pathways and that kind of thing. So do you do much work with people? Do you get many people in who are um, getting treatment for 
any of the whole range of psychological or psychiatric um, yeah, conditions and absolutely. they want and they want to get off of the meds or they want to decrease the meds do you get a lot of that yeah, um, yes so when oftentimes when people come in on medications it is outside of my scope to take them off of their medication so I don't do that but what I can do is I help them at a very foundational level to build themselves so I think that a very important aspect of mental health is uh, the gut health, right? So we have this gut brain connection that is very, very important. And that is one area that we can work on very intensely. Um, so there's a thing called leaky gut syndrome or permeable um, small intestine, where um, for some reason the tight junctions in, um, and some people start to open up a little bit and um, little bits of proteins from our food get out into the bloodstream that are larger than what, um, what should get out there. And so when that happens, the immune system starts to mount a response. There's inflammation. And when there's inflammation, that can affect the nervous system and that can affect um, what's going on in the brain. Also, we know that there are certain um, bacteria that are you know, very friendly that we need to have in our gut. We need to have a very wide, diverse um, gut ecology. And what's happened over time um, with the change in our diet and taking different uh, medications and different chemicals that we're exposed to, that uh, diversity in the gut has really decreased over the course of the last 100 years, um, but especially probably in the last 50 years. And so with that, we see an increase of all types of diseases. Um, you know, whether it is something that's affecting the brain and the nervous system and our mental health, um, but also physical problems. And so one of the cornerstones of naturopathy is that, um, you know, disease often begins in the gut. So if we can address what's going on in the gut, that can lay a really nice foundation to start building off of. And when a person is able to um, start building this stronger foundation, then they can work with their doctor um, to you know, start stepping off of certain medications. Do you ever consult with the physicians about the support you can have for your patients and or what might be needed for them to either decrease or wean off of some of the more powerful psychotropic meds? Usually it's the patient that is the go-between. Between. So, you know, I can present them with the information to, uh, to share with their doctor. One of the, um, the other cornerstones of naturopathy is the empowerment of the patient. So really educating them to a point that they can advocate for themselves. And so they can consult with their doctor and say, this is what I learned, here's some, here's some research, what do you think about this in my particular situation? So really getting the patient to the point where they understand what's going on in their body. Um, so it's, it's doctor as teacher. Well, I, I get a lot of this and more and more people are getting exposed to Robert Whitaker's book, The Anatomy of an Epidemic. And um, learning in different ways how, while it might be helpful to have a medication in the short term, most of the medications that are given for anything to do with schizophrenia, bipolar, manic depressive episodes, depression, anxiety, over the long term, they have all kinds of negative impacts on our general health. And so um, it's good to have people like you as a resource to help people who've gotten perhaps stabilized on a medication but don't want to stay in it long term to be able to develop an ongoing plan for their whole health. Um, there's a, a, a place in Vermont that is called Inner Fire and I was uh, privileged to do the, an interview with um, the owner, a founder of Inner Fire where the, what they call themselves is a proactive healing community offering a choice for adults to recover from debilitating traumatic life challenges without the use of psychotropic medications. So they don't force people to go off. They don't say you can't be here uh, unless you leave your medications, but they have that holistic, integrative, whole person approach to mental and emotional health. And that's what I hear from most people I know that have naturopathic training. And that's 
that's your bailiwick. Right. Yeah. So, you know, working with a person where they're at, if they are stabilized on a medication and they want to stay on their medication, um, by all means, working to support them. Um, one of the ways that we can work to support them is we can figure out, is that particular medication um, depleting them of a particular nutrient, for example? So do we really need to pay attention to zinc? Or do we really need to pay attention to B6 because of this particular medication? And we can help to support them on a nutritional or supplemental level um, you know, and to empower them to be able to continue to take their medication, but just sort of buffer some of those effects. Um, there are some other things that we could do as well as far as herbs that help to buffer the effects of stressors in life. And so whether that is chemical for medication or, um, you know, just stress in general, because as, as you know, um, you know, the sort of chronic stress that we have um, in modern living um, is one of the things that really, um, you know, causes a, a person's, you know, any, any condition they have can become worse with ongoing chronic stress. And so we can buffer them with something called adaptogenic herbs, um, which are herbs that, um, it's sort of a newer category of herbs. Um, it was really sort of coined back in the 1950s. Um, there were um, actually researchers in uh, Russia at the time who um, were looking for ways um, to help their workers to be more productive. Um, and this is kind of a little bit dark actually. Um, even though they lived in you know, conditions that were um, subpar, um, their nutrition maybe wasn't great and they had to work a lot of hours and they wanted to figure out a way for them to not be as impacted by that sort of daily stress. Um, and so they researched um, several different herbs including um, one that's called Eleuthero or Siberian ginseng um, and they found that, um, you know, the cortisol levels of these people were lower. They found that they were able to work um, longer, harder hours and not get sick as often. And not that that's something that we want to reflect in, you know, today's society. Uh, we obviously want people to, it's so important for people to take time to rest and um, rejuvenate and that kind of thing. But um, if we are going to help buffer the unavoidable stresses in life, so you know you've had a new baby or you're taking um, some medications that um, are maybe like stressful to your ba your body, excuse me, or, or or you have to learn to work at home and homeschool your kids and not see any friends for months on end. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so when um, you know when when we're faced with these unavoidable stressful situations. Um, this category of herbs, the adaptogenic herbs, which include things like ashwagandha, rhodiola, schizandra, holy basil, um, and eleuthero, some of the different ginsengs, um, either individually or in a particular formula, if we can match a person to um, those particular um, herbs, we can help buffer all of these different stresses um, that they may be facing, you know, whether it's chemical, um, you know, environmental, um, and you know personal stresses. So, do you have a a story or two of of that would be um, illustrative of how when someone comes to you, the herbal and the systemic approach you use has provided them significant improvement? Yeah, yeah. So, um, one of my my cases that comes to mind that sort of is one of my uh, one of my favorites is um, I have been seeing uh, one lady in particular and she's you know she's had many different stresses she's had you know a chronic viral infection that's really sort of impeded her um, ability to work her in the, her anxiety levels sort of you know really took off with um, with this so I mean everything changed in her life and um, you know and on top of that she was dealing with some chronic fatigue um, and, you know, we, we did some things at, you know, a very foundational level, um, you know, as far as working on nutrition, working on, you know, getting her healthy. But I think one of the things that made the biggest impact for her um, was when we were able to connect her to the correct um, adaptogenic herb for her, which was ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is an herb um, from the um, Ayurvedic tradition. Um, it's from India. Um, and it is an herb that... Um, it modulates the immune system, so um, that means it helps to balance it. So whether you have an overactive immune system or an underactive immune system, it helps to balance it. 
Um, one of the other things ashwagandha does is it has a tremendous impact for many people um, on their anxiety levels. And so she, she would experience anxiety that felt like um, a heavy pressure on her chest. And, um, you know, it took a little while to kind of find the right form for her. Um, she was one of the, the people who, um, you know, didn't do well with, uh, with a direct tincture, for example, which is a, an extract into alcohol. Um, but we were able to play around with it a little bit and found that a very traditional way of using ashwagandha, which is to use an ashwagandha powder in um, like in a milky or milk-like based substance um, with some warming herbs, um, really worked very well for her. And she said that when she takes the ashwagandha, she does not have this heavy feeling of pressure on her chest that she associates with the anxiety. And the anxiety levels have gone down tremendously. So that's that's one of my, my favorite stories about um, you know, using adaptogenic herbs and just how, um, how life-changing that can be for, for an individual. Because, you know, she, she was dealing with, you know, quite a lot with her chronic viral infection and, you know, everything changing in her life. Um, well, and if, if, you're, if you're someone who's experienced anxiety, you understand it's a tremendous energy drain. Yeah. So if you're already dealing with other physical problems, which are demanding energy from your system to try and heal and recover... Uh, anxiety just drains you all the more. So I imagine she was getting quite a bit of relief oh. in, in a compound ways when mm -hmm. the herb was working for her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then you know, um, you know, working with folks who have um, you know varying levels of depression, um, you know, and working with them, um, I've oftentimes the people who are attracted to come uh, to see me are people who um, say. I really don't want to start a medication. What are some things that I can try first? And, um, you know, so we've had several situations where we really address things on a nutritional level. Um, I can't say enough about the power of B vitamins, um, particularly niacin, um, B, uh, B9, which is folate, and folate in that form, not folic acid, but folate, um, as well as B6. Um, and sort of finding, you know, the right balance for, for a person um, D vitamins are very important. I mean, you know, we've heard of seasonal affective disorder. We, we recognize the, the value of the sunshine herb or the sunshine vitamin, which is vitamin D. And um, additionally, omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3s um, are, you know, rich, you know, in, you know, like salmon and um, flax seeds and um, things like that. So the reason why omega-3 is very important is because um, it is um, really anti-inflammatory. And in our, um, in our Western culture, in our American diet, we tend to really um, emphasize omega-6, which are also essential fatty acids, but those are pro-inflammatory. And omega-3 fatty acids are um, anti-inflammatory. And if you are experiencing, um, you know, lots of these different problems, there's some inflammation going on. There's like, you know, that, that gut brain connection um, where there's just inflammation in the body and that, that can really have an impact on mental health. And so um, focusing on those uh, nutrients is really important um, as well as focusing on the ecology of the gut. We know that there are um, certain strains of bacteria that are higher in people who have uh, more depression and lower in people who um, who have more depression. And so if just working to the gut bacteria and, you know, probiotics can be really helpful. I know that there are some probiotics that are formulated specifically for um, for depression and those, those can be helpful. But more important than just what you seed your gut with, it's how you sort of um, feed your gut. So food becomes really important because if you're, if you're eating a bunch of junk food because, you know, I mean, you, you feel bad and you, you know, it, it, it's effort to, um, you know, in order to prepare like a really beautiful meal for yourself. Um, the problem with that is that that's what you continue to feed the, the bacteria in your gut and that's who you get to grow. And so, um, you know, if you, if you eat a lot of um, sugar, for example, um, it really helps um, candida, which is a particular type of yeast, to really start to grow. And candida actually interfaces with our endocrine system, our hormones, and it, and it sends messages up to the brain that says, I crave sugar, I need sugar. And it's because the yeast in the gut is hungry and it wants to reproduce more. And it causes a sugar-seeking behavior. And so if you go through a period of time where you're like, okay, I know that it's not me craving sugar. I know that it's, um, you know, this, this 
yeast in my gut. Um, or, you know, different bacteria that, you know, if you eat a lot of fast food, for example, you have like blooms of different bacteria that, that start to happen. And when you can start to shift your diet, you really shift who lives in your gut and what toxins they're able to break down, um, what vitamins they're able to produce for you, what, um, you know, what conversions they're able to help happen in, at the gut level so that you are more nourished um, on, on a very foundational holistic level. So paying attention to gut health is also extremely important. Well, right. and I, I, I have to echo what you're saying. And, and I understand that there are quite a few people who might be listening uh, to this podcast that might be thinking um, this is kind of woo woo stuff or it's uh, experimental. And as I was mentioning the, uh, the inner fire residential treatment facility, um, Beatrice Birch, who was founder of that, was an art therapist, and she used to work over in Europe. And when she came back to the United States, she was absolutely floored to discover how many people were put on all these heavy-duty medications and sometimes an entire cocktail of medications because they don't do that in Europe. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about is really solid systemic look at what we as human beings need energetically, both from our chemical and food substance, from our, our mental and emotional, our community sense, our purpose in life. And this is not a new concept. This is going back to what's worked for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And having the benefit of some of the more, um, we'll say in-depth scanning and testing results to guide people like you when you're introducing people into a balance in their body. Let me ask you, what kinds of uh, assessment tools you use? Do you use blood tests, hair analysis? What, what are you using to decide, as you were mentioning, the, the B vitamins or the D vitamins and deficiencies? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, Sometimes we use we use blood tests. Um, so I I don't have a lab in my in my particular in my office, but um, we can send folks for blood tests and we can get a really clear level of where they're, especially their vitamin D levels. I think that's a really important one that we, that we check frequently. Um, and if they if they've had other tests from their doctor, um, you know certainly they they bring those and we go over those. Um, hair analysis can be very helpful, especially when looking at mineral levels. Um, Mental health is greatly impacted by exposure to heavy metals. Um, and so hair analysis does give us some really good information on heavy metals as well. And for somebody like me, when you want to do a hair analysis, how, how hard is that? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if we can you know, get some, some beard hair. <laughs> well, so... I, you, you mentioned uh, another gentleman who does herbs in your area, um, and uh, how did you hook up with him? How do you know him? Is it Jim yeah, McDonald? So, yeah, yeah. So he's he's well known um, through the herbalist community, and so you know after hearing about him ten or twelve times from herbalists who really seemed to know what they were talking about, I checked out one of his YouTube videos, and I thought, wow, this guy like he, what a what a interesting guy and. Um, what a wealth of knowledge. And so uh, I signed up for one of his uh, year long herbal intensives and I learned an amazing amount of information and I refer to it frequently with my clients. So, and I really appreciate the fact that he would take us out into the field and help us to learn to identify plants and then, you know, tell us how they're prepared and, um, you know, and, and, and be able to like, you know, introduce our, our people then to a plant like hey this 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 grows in your backyard um this is or this grows in the woods near your house and these plants are, are here and they are um you know if you if you want to learn about them it's it's yours for the taking which is very empowering for people to learn that they can make their own medicine they don't have to um you know spend as much money um as you know if, as if you had to buy everything from a health food store and so what's the you know like if this particular plant or herb is growing in, in my backyard yeah. um what has to happen do i just have to reach over pick it up and start chewing it do i have to do preparations what yes. what can we learn from you about yeah. how complex this is do i have to become a chemist 
no, <laughs> no. People have been using plants for ever, right? I mean, since the, the dawn of human civilization. And, um, you know, people learned early on that there's lots of different ways and there's some ways that are better to work with certain plants than others. But for most plants, you can just pick them and dry them and pour hot water over them and then drink them as a tea. So um, so that's, that's one of the most simple ways to do it. Um, I also teach people how to make tinctures, which is an alcohol extract. Um, alcohol is really great at helping to pull out certain constituents from plants. Um, and so oftentimes we'll use like 100 proof vodka um, because vodka is a very clean um, palate on a, um, so on a molecular level. It, it doesn't have things that take up uh, different molecular spots. So it's able to pull as uh, much from a particular plant as possible, whereas like rum might not be able to pull as much. So we use 100 proof vodka. Um, we chop up the plant, we put the plant matter in the vodka, we shake it on a regular basis, like every day or so um, for four to six weeks. And then we can strain the plant material out. And what's left is um, an extract of the um, potent constituents in that plant. So, um, you know, there's, you, you can fine tune that, but that's, that's as simple as, you know, as it takes. And, um, you know, people okay, have been- so then, so then you've got this 100 proof vodka. Yeah. You're not serving it as a cocktail drink. Do you just take like a drop or two yeah added yeah, to your so, tea or something like that? Is that how you use a tincture? Yeah, so with a tea, you would have to drink like, you know, a whole cup full. And so if it's something that tastes pretty bad, um, then that's sometimes pretty hard for people to choke a whole cup full down, but it becomes really concentrated when it's in the alcohol extract. And so you're able to take, you know, maybe 10, 20, 30 drops in, um, in a, you know, in a small drink of water and, and swallow it down from there. And so um, it, it's helpful, you know, for one, for humans, if it tastes terrible, but also, um, you know, if we're, if we're wanting to conserve plant material. So if it's something that you don't have a whole lot of, for example, um, and you want to, you know, um, make it last for the winter, for example, and you, you can't dry enough for tea for the whole winter, then a tincture is a good idea. All right. So there's a tincture as a possibility. There's uh, making a tea out of an herb. What, what other ways do we find these plants, whether we're, we're getting them from you at your apothecary or you're, we're finding them in the backyard, what other ways are there to prepare or ingest these herbs or apply them? Maybe I don't ingest them. Sure. Um, so, I mean, it can be as simple as dandelion leaves, right, which you can buy from many farmers markets. Um, you can buy them as capsules um, in a health food store or you can order them online. Um, and, you know, in, people can ingest them, you know, like, like I said, like dandelion leaves. Dandelion leaves are um, bitter. And in our, you know, our American diet, we tend to avoid the flavor of bitter. Um, but bitter is really important for all of our digestive functions. So when our taste buds detect bitter, um, which we have taste buds not only on our tongue, but actually all the way down into our digestive system and to a certain extent in our lungs as well. It causes a whole series of reactions to occur. Um, we produce um, more bile and more gastrin and more like all of these hormones that are really important for digestion that really help you to extract the nutrients from your food. And um, for, for mental health, being well nourished is very important. And so um, bitters are important for mental health. They're, they're very grounding for a lot of people. Um, it's helpful for, you know, for gas and bloating and um, it helps people to have regular bowel movements, which is also very important for mental health too, because not only you know, um, if somebody is constipated, not only is um, that gonna affect their, their mental health, but also um, you know, for toxins to sort of like seep back through the bowel into the bloodstream, that's gonna impact mental health too. So having, um, having like regular bowel movements is super important. So bitters is, can certainly be an important aspect of that. And so when you're talking about dandelion leaves, are you talking about putting them in salads? Are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah, so, um, so dandelion leaves, um, I mean, for sure, get a clean source if, you know, if you um, you know, your neighbor sprays, for example, you want to avoid that. Or if, um, you know, you've got, you know, pets that may be, you know, peeing on the lawn or something like that. You want to get a clean source of dandelion leaves. But yes, absolutely. Incorporate them just a little bit at a time. Um, also, like some, you know, other greens that we're familiar with that are in spring greens, like endive, radicchio, arugula, all of those are bitters as well. And so if we introduce a little bit of bitters at the beginning of a meal, um, that can really get the whole digestive process moving. Um, 
some people really, really don't like to do it that way. So you can get bitters like actually as an extract, as a tincture, and you could sort of just, you know, put like a little spray or a dropper um, on your tongue to really sort of get those digestive juices flowing. So what other kinds of uh, uh, unusual leafy substances might we be looking for? Sure, yeah. So, um, gosh, one of, my, one of my favorites that's just coming into bloom right now is um, wild bee balm, Monarda fistulosa. And um, it's just coming into bloom. And um, that one is really great for um, the digestive system. It's also antimicrobial. Um, and it has a very clearing um, scent. It's, um, mm -hmm. It helps to clear the mind. Can you say uh, the name again? Yep, it's Wild Bee Balm or Monarda Fistulosa. Okay. So that's the name of it. Um, and it gets these like, you know, this crazy little purple flower on it. Um, and it can be used in place of um, uh, oregano. So, you know, you can use it as like a, sort of a, it's got a similar flavor to oregano, a similar, um, and so you can use it as, as a spice in, in your food. You can, you know, dry some and, you know, put it in your spaghetti sauce in the winter time. Um, there's all kinds of fun ways to incorporate um, herbs. So are you are you there looking at the flower or the the leaves of that wild bee balm? Yeah, so the flowering top. So um, for that particular plant, um, you know, if we harvest it just as it's coming into bloom, that's when um, all of the um, the chemical constituents or the, the energy of the plant, if you prefer to put it that way, um, is, is most concentrated in the upper parts of the plant. And it's a very aromatic plant. And so we we um, we use the flowering tops, which means like the top stems and leaves and the flowers. And so, you know, you take that and you can dry it and um, make tea out of it. Um, really great for the, the bladder, actually. Um, uh, it's antimicrobial. So, you know, it can be something that somebody can use if they're prone to, you know, some uh, like urinary tract infections and that kind of thing. So, okay. um, one of the other herbs that is a, um, a native to Michigan that, um, that I do really rely on for a lot of folks um, with regards to their, their mental state is called skull cap. Um, and it's just like, it's spelled just how it, um, it sounds. So skull, like the skull cap. So, and um, just like the name sort of sounds, it's kind of like, you know, there's all of these irritations kind of coming at you from the world around you. And you just kind of like, want to put like a hood over your head and just kind of retreat from the world because um, smells are annoying to you. Sounds are annoying to you. Um, you know, maybe your spouse and the way that they chew is about to drive you out of your seat. You know, um, so all of these irritations are affecting your stress levels. Um, oftentimes, you know, strong scents, strong light, like just, you know, um, are making you very cranky and irritable. Um, Skull cap is one of the herbs that you can start incorporating more as a tea or a tincture, that one. Um, and people start to find that, um, their irritation levels start to come down. I know for me, for example, um, when I start getting stressed out, I clench my jaw when I'm working, right? Like just clench my jaw. But when I'm taking skull cap, I don't do that as much. And my dentist can tell. <laughs> he says, oh, you know, like, you know, I can, I can tell you're grinding your teeth or you're clenching your jaw. And when, I, when I'm good in taking my skull cap, I don't get those comments from my dentist. So that's that's a really good one for, especially um, for people who um, maybe even like have, uh, you know, like they think they're doing fine and then all of a sudden like they just like blow up for a minute and they just yell at people around them. And then they're like, oh, that actually felt better. I got that off of my chest. So, so those are um, some of the, um, the hints that skull cap might be beneficial for that person. And, and so, how, how do you take it personally? I take it as a tincture. Um, it's easiest to take as a tincture, I think. So, um, you know, a few drops um, in water, or sometimes I'll just take it straight if I'm hurt in a hurry. It doesn't taste great, but, um, you know, you get used to it if, you, if you've been taking tinctures for a while. Yeah, I, I remember years ago, someone told me that oregano oil was really good mm -hmm. for um, antiseptic, antifungal, et cetera. And they said, just put a few drops under your tongue. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I did. And, and I'm one of those people who can tolerate, you know, some hot sauces and some rather <laughs> strong flavors. And I went to the family and said, this is the greatest thing because I have a family that had a lot of upper respiratory infections. And here, try this. And not one person in my family talked to me for a year after that. <laughs> they were like, go! Right. The worst. <laughs> uh, come on. I thought, you know, it's just a little weird taste in your mouth for, for a few minutes. And then 
and you get healthier, but they weren't having any of it. So yeah, I, I do have to warn people about the flavor of tinctures when they, you know, when they go to, to try them for the first time and, you know, try it like in, in, and one of the mistakes sometimes that people make is they're like, okay, well, she said to dilute it. And so they'll dilute it in a big glass of water. And then every sip tastes pretty bad. So right. I tell people to put in a small amount of water and then maybe have a chaser if you need afterwards. So like, you know, chase it with more pleasant tasting tea or a little juice or something. And, like. it's, and it's okay to wash it down. Right. Mm -hmm. Some of these people say, well, you don't get the effects unless you hold the oregano oil in your mouth under your tongue for right. a period of time. But yeah. And, you know, and there's something to be said about sublingual taking, you know, certain things sublingually um, because it does, it bypasses the digestion and it gets like right into the bloodstream. Um, and so if it's something that, you know, isn't alcohol based, it tastes terrible. Alcohol is a pretty good carrier and, it, um, and it's very easily digestible, which is one of the reasons I prefer tinctures over like capsules and that kind of thing. Because not everybody's digestion is 100 percent and you might lose um, some of that that the herb through the digestive tract you might not absorb it all before it passes through the digestive tract so um, taking it as a liquid it passes very easily um, so if you have somebody who's got a problem with addictions and doesn't want anything alcohol based is there a way to get a tincture in that doesn't yeah. involve the vodka Yes. So there are other um, substrates that you can use, um, other um, solvents. Um, so you can use, um, uh, there's something called vegetable glycerin that, um, that sometimes can be used. It doesn't pull as wide of um, a variety of things as like vodka would, for example, but um, it's considered to you know, be perfectly acceptable. Um, teas are a great choice. Um, uh, my husband's actually a substance abuse therapist. And so, um, you know, so sometimes, you know, like, you know, he'll, like, people will come into my store who are, are dealing with that very problem. So I specifically stock, especially some of the Nervines, especially, you know, folks who are, you know, really, like, trying to, like, find some support when they are, um, you know, their nervous system and maybe their B vitamin status is um, really suffered through their, um, their addiction process. And so, you know, using things like um, skull cap is a wonderful one. Um, something called milky oats. Um, and uh, uh, some of the B vitamins, I think, are some of the things that are some of the most helpful for, for these folks. And so um, we have tinctures that are commercially prepared that are um, vegetable glycerin based. Um, you can also use um, uh, vinegar to, to draw certain things out of herbs. And so a lot of times there's like vinegar based tinctures as well, but um, it, it sometimes pulls more mineral based things than um, some of the alkaloids that, that we're looking for. So um, my first choice, if, if someone can handle it, is um, an alcohol based one, but if not, then um, typically the glycerides. And when you're talking about vinegar, you're talking about white or apple cider or what? Yeah, so a lot of times it's apple cider vinegar that people will use, um, but you know, some sort of acetic acid is, is going to, um, it's going to pull some of those constituents. So. Mm -hmm. Well, it, as we're closing out here, is there some aspect of your work that we haven't even touched on yet that you want to share with us? Um, yeah, sure. So um, one of the um, things that I sort of mentioned just briefly in the beginning is really um, working to fine tune somebody's uh, nutrition. Um, and I mentioned that one of my, my interests that I studied um, in college um, before I went to naturopathic school was genetics. And so I sort of learned a way to kind of marry the two. Um, so I help people to really like figure out that nutritional plan that's really useful to them. Um, we look at um, some genetic factors. So if they've had, um, you know, a test like, it's, for example, like 23andMe or Ancestry.com or something like that, we're able to extract some information from that raw data. So that's that's one of the pieces of information we use. Um, another piece of information that we use is um, uh, we do several different measurements of the body to try and figure out some symmetry, left to right symmetry, um, uh, you know, length of torso compared to leg, upper body, lower body, upper leg, lower leg. Um, so some of those things are clues to some of the things that they were exposed to um, in utero. So um, there's some epigenetic factors, which means above genetics, which means how the environment 
impacted the way your genes are turned on or turned off um, or upregulated or downregulated. Um, and then we look at blood type. That's an important component as well because our blood type is an expression of our immune system and part of what you know we use to recognize self and non-self. Um, because not only is that, that um, on the surface of that identifying marker on the surface of our blood cells, but um, it can be all the way through our digestive tract as well. And so, um, so I use all of that, put it together um, in a program that I have and um, figure out what foods are gonna most benefit a person. And it's been really, really interesting to see, um, you know, some of the changes that have occurred for, for some people. Um, I, can, I, can, I can speak to my own personal experience. Um, when I tried it, I was like, well, you know, I feel like I'm a pretty, you know, healthy person, but I'm sure there's probably something that, you know, can shift. And one of the things that I learned is that um, absolutely tomatoes is something I should not eat, which is terrible for me because tomatoes is my favorite food probably. <laughs> and so that was, that was, you know, very difficult, but I was like, I'll give it a try and see. And um, in the course of that 45 or 60 days, I didn't notice like a really big change that happened outright. And I think that's very common for people. They don't like, you know, things are shifting so gradually with your emotions and you know what's going on in your body. Sometimes you don't recognize it, but it's when you add it back in, that's where the experiment really occurs. When you add it back in and you just, oh my gosh, I remember feeling like this. I remember, and I, for me, it was inflammation. And I didn't realize how much inflammation I had in my back muscles. And because I always felt like, oh, I just want someone to push on my back. I want, you know, I'm on a massage or something like that. And I didn't realize that that was slowly dissipating over that 45 to 60 days. And then, um, and then, you know, I felt it when it came back. And I hear that story, you know, over and over from, from people. Like, I had no idea. That was a food I ate all the time. I had no idea it impacted me. And remember, inflammation is, like, such an important aspect of, you know, all kinds of things that go imbalanced in the body. And it, for sure, impacts, um, you know, our, our mental state as well. So reducing inflammation is primary. It's key to helping to balance a person's um, state in their body. So different people experience it different ways. For me, it was in my muscles. For other people, it's... Um, you know, very much on an emotional level. So then did you decide that for the most part, you're just going to exclude tomatoes from your diet? Yeah, I occasionally, like when I, I grow some in the summertime, I deal with it. But, and then I take, I take certain herbs to help me balance that out. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I give them up. I, and only like garden fresh ones is where, where I'm at right now. It's hard. <laughs> but, um, but And, like, and I, I get that from a lot of people that even if they find out that there's a semi-adverse effect, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, someone who's not alcoholic, not an alcoholic, but they get a little headache or they feel sluggish after drinking, but they still like to party with the family. So occasionally they'll do that. Sometimes yeah, people find something. Making an informed choice. You know what I mean? If you, you know... You know, like, oh, this is something I never knew was, was, was hard on me before, but now I have that information so I can make an informed choice to maybe switch it out for something else or to buffer the effects when I do choose to have a tomato or, you know, have a glass of wine or something like that. Well, and then there are other people, well, tomatoes is one that I've heard and people will say things like, so I've learned that I abstain from the tomatoes. A lot of people do what you do. They don't eat them during the winter. They only eat them fresh from their garden because that quality and flavor is so much better. But then they'll say, you know, I, I don't have them on my salad, but I save it so I can have the pasta sauce. Or so they, they're just they're doing a little balancing act. Yeah, and if you had no idea, like I had no idea before, you know, before I sort of went into this. Um, like I, I, I consider them a health food and I tried to include them. I was like, it's a vegetable. They're rich in vitamin C and lycopene and all this wonderful stuff. Um, and I, I consider them to be a health food, but now, you know, now that I know I, I consider them. Little did you know that, that your body was doing different stuff with it. That's right. Yeah. And now, everybody's different. Now, everybody's now just quickly before we completely run out of time here, did, am I understanding you to say that you discovered through genetic information or measurements of different parts of your body that that was something you should look at excluding to see what the impact yeah. was? Yeah, absolutely. That's right. So, um, you know, taking all of those bits of information and, um, and, and, it, and it's a fairly com comprehensive program. So um, it looks at um, 
at, at different types of meats and what ones are beneficial for you. It looks at different types of legumes and which ones are beneficial and harmful and which ones are just neutral. Um, and, you know, all, all, all sorts of categories of food. Um, and it's really interesting because, um, you know, you've heard the saying, Jack Spratt could eat no, no fat, his wife could eat no lean. That's my husband and me. Like we have pretty, I mean, we've got some overlap, but, you know, he, he's supposed to eat a pretty, um, you know, heavy meat diet, um, pre-paleo, um, avoid grains. Whereas, you know, um, I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm supposed to like be, you know, mostly vegetarian and some, mo most grains seem to be okay for me. So it's, it's so, so you mentioned that it's a mm -hmm. comprehensive program. Does the program yeah. have a name? Yeah, so it is called SWAMI, S-W-A-M-I. That's an acronym, and I haven't been able to figure out exactly what the acronym is for. Um, but it is through the Diadamo program. Um, and so uh, Dr. Diadamo is a naturopathic doctor who, um, you know, actually his family for two generations have been working on working with blood type. But then he has really elevated it to a more fine-tuned level because by including the genetics and the epigenetics component. Um, and it, uh, a lot of people have heard of the blood type diet before, but the sort of, you know, and it seems like that helps people like you know, 70, 75%, maybe 80%, but then you put this other layer on and it becomes really personalized and opens things up for people. And um, we've seen some really great results with it. All right, excellent. Are you, uh, is there a way to, for people to work with you even if they can't make it to Michigan? Um, yeah, we probably could to a certain extent. Um, like I'd have to show you how to do some measurements and that kind of thing for, for the SWAMI in particular. But I do um, offer telehealth services as well for naturopathic consultation. So um, right. I'm so more if, proficient with that over COVID. So, so, so if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, so um, reaching out to me um, via email, um, Hawthorne and Violet at gmail.com. Um, is a, a, a great way to, to initially reach out to me. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share your information with our audience. And I look forward to staying in touch and finding out what you're doing uh, as the summer and the winter comes. Maybe we'll have you back in the winter and talk about how we uh, use your services when it's not as sunshiny. Right. <laughs> Sounds All right. good. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Appreciate the time. Thank you, Timothy. Have a good day. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye. Okay, Rebecca Cully Healy, ND, completed her studies at the Naturopathic Institute of Therapies and Education and was board certified by the American Naturopathic Medical Certification Board in 2017. Her areas of special interest are herbalism and genetics. Rebecca also holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology with an emphasis in genetics, psychology, and women's studies. She is the owner of Hawthorne and Violet Naturopathic Services and Herbal Apothecary in Fenton, Michigan, a unique herb store that offers over 200 organic dried herbs, tinctures, and other natural health products. Rebecca offers consultations in person and online, as well as classes on herbalism and other natural health topics. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening. 